Welcome back to the Dusty Tome. The focus of this episode is part three of the great god Pan. After the wild doctor broke poor Mary's mind with a failed brain surgery that was supposed to leave her seeing the spiritual reality as Clark watched on in horror in part one, we then got a deeper look into the occult interests and specific knowledge of Clark in part two. If you've missed any of those, I'm putting up a link above now to the Great God Pan playlist so you can catch up. In this episode, we pan <laughs> away from our characters to a complete set of new ones, starting with Villiers of Wadham, a dynamic Londonite, and Charles Herbert, an old and currently down and out friend of Villiers from university. Also special in this episode, we have our friend Christoph Fruru from the Miniature Mythos channel stepping in to play Austin. Over at the Miniature Mythos, they also read some really great literature, and in addition, they do some really fantastic miniature painting. So please go check them out, and a subscribe surely wouldn't hurt either. We'll have a panel linked to his channel at the end of the video, and more info in the description below. So without further ado, let's get right to it. And as usual, we'll see you on the other side. The Great God Pan, part three, the city of resurrections. Herbert, good God, is it possible? Yes, my name's Herbert. I think I know your face, too, but I don't remember your name. My memory is very queer. Don't you recollect Villiers of Wadham? Well, so it is, so it is. I beg your pardon, Villiers. I didn't think I was begging an old college friend. Good night. My dear fellow, this haste is unnecessary. My rooms are close by, but we won't go there just yet. Suppose we walk up Shaftesbury Avenue a little way. But how, in heaven's name, have you come to this pass, Herbert? It's a long story, Villiers, and a strange one too. But you can hear it if you like. Come on then, take my arm, you don't seem very strong. The ill-assorted pair moves slowly up Rupert Street. The one in dirty, evil-looking rags, and the other attired in the regulation uniform of a man about town, trim, glossy, and eminently well-to-do. Villiers had emerged from his restaurant after an excellent dinner of many courses, assisted by an ingratiating little flask of Chianti, and in that frame of mind which was with him, almost chronic, had delayed a moment by the door, peering round in a dimly lighted street in search of those mysterious incidents and persons with which the streets of London teem in every quarter and at every hour. Villiers prided himself as a practiced explorer of such obscure mazes and byways of London life, and in this unprofitable pursuit he displayed an assiduity which was worthy of more serious employment. Thus he stood beside the lamppost, surveying the passers-by with undisguised curiosity, and with that gravity only known to the systematic diner, had just enunciated in his mind the formula London had been called the City of Encounters. It is more than that. It is the City of Resurrections. When these reflections were suddenly interrupted by a piteous whine at his elbow and a deplorable appeal for alms, he looked round in some irritation and with a sudden shock found himself confronted with the embodied proof of his somewhat stilted fancies. There, close beside him, his face altered and disfigured by poverty and disgrace, his body barely covered by greasy, ill-fitting rags, stood his old friend, Charles Herbert, who had matriculated on the same day as himself, and with whom he had been merry and wise for twelve revolving terms. Different occupations and varying interests had interrupted the friendship, and it was six years since Villiers had seen Herbert. And now he looked upon this wreck of a man with grief and dismay, mingled with a certain inquisitiveness as to what dreary chain of circumstance had dragged him down to such a doleful pass. 
Villiers felt together with compassion all the relish of the amateur in mysteries and congratulated himself on his leisurely speculations outside the restaurant. They walked on in silence for some time, and more than one passerby stared in astonishment at the unaccustomed spectacle of a well-dressed man with an unmistakable beggar hanging on to his arm, and observing this, Villiers led the way to an obscure street in Soho. Here, he repeated his question. How on earth has it happened, Herbert? I always understood you would succeed to an excellent position in Dorsetshire. Did your father disinherit you? Surely not. No, Villiers. I came into all the property at my poor father's death. He died a year after I left Oxford. He was a very good father to me, and I mourned his death sincerely enough. But you know what young men are. A few months later, I came up to town and went a good deal into society. Of course, I had excellent introductions, and I managed to enjoy myself very much in a harmless sort of way. I played a little, certainly, but never for heavy stakes. And the few bets I made on races brought me in money. Only a few pounds. You know, but enough to pay for cigars and such petty pleasures. It was in my second season that the tide turned. Of course you've heard of my marriage. No, I've never heard anything about it. Yes, I married Villiers. I met a girl, a girl of the most wonderful and most strange beauty. At the house with some people whom I knew. I cannot tell you her age, I never knew it. But so far as I can guess, I should think she must have been about 19 when I made her acquaintance. My friends had come to know her at Florence. She told them she was an orphan. The child of an English father and an Italian mother, and she charmed them as she charmed me. The first time I saw her was at an evening party. I was standing by the door talking to a friend when suddenly above the hum and babble of conversation, a voice which seemed to thrill my heart. She was singing an Italian song. I was introduced to her that evening and in three months I married Helen. Filiere, that woman, if I can call her woman, corrupted my soul. The night of the wedding I found myself sitting in her bedroom in the hotel, listening to her talk. She was sitting up in bed and I listened to her. She spoke in her beautiful voice, spoke of things which even now I would not dare whisper in the blackest night, though I stood in the midst of a wilderness. You, Villiers, you may think you know life in London and what goes on day and night in this dreadful city. For all I can say, you may have heard the talk of the vilest. But I tell you, you can have no conception of what I know. No, not in your most fantastic, hideous dreams can you have imaged forth the faintest shadow of what I have heard and seen. Yes, seen. I have seen the incredible, such horrors that even I myself sometimes stop in the middle of the street and ask whether it is possible for a man to behold such things and live. In a year, Villiers, I was a ruined man in body and soul, in body and soul. But your property, Herbert, you had land in Dorset. I sold it all, the fields and the woods, the dear old house, everything. And the money? She took it all from me. And then left you? Yes, she disappeared one night. I don't know where she went, but I'm sure if I saw her again, it would kill me. The rest of my story is of no interest. Sordid misery, that's all. You may think, Villiers, that I have exaggerated and talked for effect, but I have not told you half. I could tell you certain things which would convince you, but you would never know a happy day again. You would pass the rest of your life as I pass mine, a haunted man, a man who has seen hell. Villiers took the unfortunate man to his rooms and gave him a meal. Herbert could eat little and scarcely touched a glass of wine set before him. He sat moody and silent by the fire and seemed relieved when Villiers sent him away with a small present of money. By the way, Herbert, said Villiers as they parted at the door. What was your wife's name? You said Helen, I think. Helen what? The name she passed under when I met her was Helen Vaughn, but what her real name was I can't say. I don't think she had a name. No, not in that sense. Only human beings have names, Villiers. I can't say any more. 
goodbye. Yes, I will not fail to call if I see any way in which you can help me. Good night. The man went out into the bitter night, and Villiers returned to his fireside. There was something about Herbert which shocked him inexpressibly. Not his poor rags or the marks which poverty had set upon his face, but rather an indefinite terror which hung about him like a mist. He had acknowledged that he himself was not devoid of blame. The woman he had avowed had corrupted him body and soul, and Villiers felt that this man, once his friend, had been an actor in scenes evil beyond the power of words. His story needed no confirmation, he himself was the embodied proof of it. Villiers mused curiously over the story he had heard, and wondered whether he had heard both the first and the last of it. No, he thought. Certainly not the last. Probably only the beginning. A case like this is like a nest of Chinese boxes. You open one after another and find a quainter workmanship in every box. Most likely poor Herbert is merely one of the outside boxes. There are stranger ones to follow. Villiers could not take his mind away from Herbert and his story, which seemed to grow wilder as the night wore on. The fire began to burn low, and the chilly air of the morning crept into the room. Villiers got up with a glance over his shoulder, and shivering slightly, went to bed. A few days later, he saw at his club a gentleman of his acquaintance named Austin, who was famous for his intimate knowledge of London life, both in its tenebrous and luminous phases. Villiers, still full of his encounter in Soho and its consequences, thought Austin might possibly be able to shed some light on Herbert's history, and so after some casual talk, he suddenly put the question. Do you happen to know anything of a man named Herbert? Charles Herbert? Austin turned round sharply and stared at Villiers with some astonishment. Charles Herbert? Weren't you in town three years ago? No? Then you have not heard of the Paul Street case. It caused a good deal of sensation at the time. What was the case? Well, a gentleman, a man of very good position, was found dead, stark dead, in the area of a certain house in Paul Street, off Tottenham Court Road. Of course, the police did not make the discovery. If you happen to be sitting up all night and have a light in your window, the constable will ring the bell, but if you happen to be lying dead in somebody's area, you will be left alone. In this instance, as in many others, the alarm was raised by some kind of vagabond. I don't mean a common tramp or a public house loafer, but a gentleman whose business or pleasure or both made him a spectator of the London streets at five o'clock in the morning. This individual was, as he said, going home. It did not appear whence or whither and had occasion to pass through Paul Street between four and five a.m. Something or other caught his eye at number 20. He said, absurdly enough, that the house had the most unpleasant physiognomy he had ever observed. But, at any rate, he glanced down the area and was a good deal astonished to see a man lying on the stones, his limbs all huddled together, and his face turned up. Our gentleman thought his face looked peculiarly ghastly, and so set off at a run in search of the nearest policeman. The constable was at first inclined to treat the matter lightly, suspecting common drunkenness. However, he came and, after looking at the man's face, changed his tone quickly enough. The early bird, who had picked up this fine worm, was sent off for a doctor, and the policeman rang and knocked at the door till a slatternly servant girl came down looking more than half asleep. The constable pointed out the contents of the area to the maid, who screamed loudly enough to wake up the street, but she knew nothing of the man, had never seen him at the house, and so forth. Meanwhile, the original discoverer had come back with a medical man, and the next thing was to get into the area. The gate was open, so the whole court had stumped down the steps. The doctor hardly needed a moment's examination. He said the poor fellow had been dead for several hours and it was then the case began to get interesting. The dead man had not been robbed, and in one of his pockets were papers identifying him as 
well as a man of good family and means, a favorite in society, and nobody's enemy as far as could be known. I don't give his name, Villiers, because it has nothing to do with the story, and because it's no good raking up these affairs about the dead when there are no relations living. The next curious point was that the medical men couldn't agree as to how he met his death. There were some slight bruises on his shoulders, but they were so slight that it looked as if he had been pushed roughly out of the kitchen door, and not thrown over the railings from the street or even dragged down the steps. But there were positively no other marks of violence about him, certainly none that would account for his death. And when they came to the autopsy, there wasn't a trace of poison of any kind. Of course, the police wanted to know all about the people of number 20. And here again, so I heard from private sources, one or two other very curious points came out. It appears that the occupants of the house were a Mr. and Mrs. Charles Herbert. He was said to be a landed proprietor, though it struck most people that Paul Street was not exactly the place to look for country gentry. As for Mrs. Herbert, nobody seemed to know who or what she was, and between ourselves, I fancy the divers after her history found themselves in rather strange waters. Of course, they both denied knowing anything about the deceased, and in default of any evidence against them, they were discharged. But some very odd things came out about them. Though it was between five and six in the morning when the dead man was removed, a large crowd had collected and several of the neighbors ran to see what was going on. They were pretty free with their comments, by all accounts, and from these it appeared that number 20 was in very bad odor in Paul Street. The detectives tried to trace down these rumors to some solid foundation of fact but could not get a hold of anything. People shook their heads and raised their eyebrows and thought the Herberts rather queer, would rather not be seen going into their house, and so on. There was nothing tangible. The authorities were morally certain the man met his death in some way or another in the house and was thrown out by the kitchen door, but they couldn't prove it and the absence of any indications of violence or poisoning left them helpless. Not case, wasn't it? But, curiously though, there is something more that I haven't told you. I happen to know one of the doctors who was consulted as to the cause of death. And some time after the inquest I met him and asked him about it. Do you really mean to tell me, I said, that you were baffled by the case, that you actually don't know what the man died of. <laughs> Pardon me, I know perfectly well what caused death. Blank died of fright, of sheer awful terror. I never saw features so hideously contorted in the entire course of my practice, and I have seen the faces of a whole host of dead. The doctor was usually a cool customer enough, and a certain vehemence in his manner struck me but I couldn't get anything more out of him. I suppose the Treasury didn't see their way to prosecuting the Herberts for frightening a man to death. At any rate, nothing was done, and the case dropped out of men's minds. Do you happen to know anything of Herbert? Well, replied Villiers, he was an old college friend of mine. You don't say so. Have you ever seen his wife? No, I haven't. I have lost sight of Herbert for many years. It's queer, isn't it? Parting with a man at a college gate or at Paddington, seeing nothing of him for years, and then finding him pop up his head in such an odd place. But I should like to have seen Mrs. Herbert. People said extraordinary things about him. What sorts of things? Well, I hardly know how to tell you. Everyone who saw her at a police court said she was at once the most beautiful woman and the most repulsive they had ever set eyes on. I have spoken to a man who saw her and I assure you he positively shuddered as he tried to describe the woman. But he couldn't tell why. 
she seems to have been a sort of enigma, and I expect if that one dead man could have told tales, he would have told some uncommonly queer ones. And there you are again in another puzzle. What could a respectable country gentleman like Mr. Blank want in such a very queer house as number 20? It's altogether a very odd case, isn't it? It is indeed, Austin. An extraordinary case. I didn't think, when I asked about my old friend, I should strike on such strange metal. Well, I must be off. Good day. Villiers went away, thinking of his own conceit of the Chinese boxes. Here was quaint workmanship indeed. Wow, what could Herbert and his otherworldly wife be getting up to that a man wound up dead from fear? And how does this all tie back to Clark and the Mad Doctor? And what is this strange metal Villiers speaks of, like Guar and Primus? Or more like Mr. Bungle? We'll find out next time in part four of The Great God Pan. Please like and subscribe so we can give you a poke when part four hits the interwebs. Also, if Instagram is your thing, please join us there. We're just spinning up a presence there. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time we open up the Dusty Tomb. <laughs>